me and my buddy Phil, and we're just very happy to have you here, and I'm sure all of our subscribers are as well. Uh, just to start it off, Alex, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself, how you ended up becoming a funder of Celsius, and just a bit of a background for our subscribers. Sure, yeah, so I, uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur, right, so I've uh, done uh, seven different uh, startups as a founder, uh, so El Celsius is for eight, and six kids at home, so I'm an underachiever, awesome. you know, one of guys. So I had uh, two, I built two unicorns in New York, one is Arbonnet, which was an exchange that it went public on NASDAQ uh, 2004 and was valued at a billion seven. Uh, and also uh, Transit Wireless, which is a company that um, provides uh, wireless services to all the people on the New York subways. Mm -hmm. um, so that's about 8 million people use it every day and they have no clue uh, how that happened after 100 years of no connectivity on the subways. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I was looking to get into FinTech for a long time mm -hmm. uh, and uh, really couldn't find the, the right entry point. Yeah. And, and I read, read Satoshi's paper, one of my employees actually sent me his paper in 2010 and I was like, that's the dumbest idea. <laughs> <It's> the slowest, <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. The slowest, most expensive database that anyone has ever created. Yeah. <laughs> Not enough electricity on the planet to mine the last Bitcoin. This exactly. Will never happen, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, so, so that was my initial feedback, and then 2013 came, and and the Mount Gox happens, and the, the community just dusts it off and keeps walking. And I was like, this is amazing. Exactly. This, if this happened on Wall Street, if the New York Stock Exchange be <laughs> shattered. And somebody stole eighty percent of the co of the of the uh, shares. Yeah, and the, the entire industry would collapse in a second. You know exactly. So crypto, crypto is special. So so I got into the game um, initially mostly advising companies, investing in projects and things like that. And then we really kind of uh, didn't see anyone uh, helping the community grow. Like, mm -hmm. You know, the Bitcoin now is whatever, 11 years old and, and the entire crypto community is like maybe 30, 40 million users. Exactly. When, you know, when the internet was 11 years old, uh, and, you know, we had like fun. So I was like, okay, we got to do something to scale up the adoption. And, and that's what we created, Daniel and I created Celsius to really focus on Okay, what uh, what is the use case that's going to bring a billion people to mm -hmm. use crypto? And and we focused on basically interest income, just allowing enabling people to earn interest on their money, and get giving them cheap loans, which was two things that the banks don't do very well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And just to add something, so we actually used to be a channel primarily focused on stocks, different IPOs and things of that nature. We only slightly covered cryptocurrency, but then recently we kind of transitioned to focus solely on cryptocurrency. So you being somebody that's been a part of the IPO market as well as the crypto space, what do you see as some of the challenges and big differences between say an IPO or NASDAQ and the S&P 500 and that type of field compared to companies in the crypto space? Sure, so you know, uh, so I, I'm the inventor of voice over IP, right? Yeah. Arginet, my original company uh, was basically one of the world's largest point providers. Uh, so we went from VoIP to MoIP to Money Over IP, mm -hmm. and we went from an IPO to an ICO, you know? And, and, exactly. Uh, and uh, what's happening really is that back in the day, uh, 95, 96, uh, you could have bought into Amazon at uh, whatever, 100, 150 yeah. million dollar valuation, right? Because the IPOs were priced at very low uh, entry points. Mm -hmm. It was very early in the companies. Uh, you know, life cycle. If you wanted to get into, um, you know, a Facebook or Uber recently, you would have paid over a hundred billion, right? Exactly. So, yeah. The problem with the IPO market is really that that all this growth, all this opportunity, uh, is being extracted uh, 
by the VCs and not by the public market. So the VCs are bringing these companies to market very, very late. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're handing off uh, the companies or the shares to the retail investors when most of the value was already extracted out of the company. So there are obviously a few exceptions, but for, for most companies, if you look at most IPOs like this year, yeah, and, you know, including Uber, including whatever. Beyond Meat as well. Right. Beyond Beyond Meat also also IPO at a really high valuation, and we're seeing that drop. And just that you bring up valuations, like we're in a time right now where it's kind of been an eight year bull run. What do you think the future is in the in the stock market with all that's going on with China and things of that nature and all the high valuable all the high valuations especially in tech and do you see any of these tariffs or these the, the problems in the world affecting Celsius directly or would you say it has no relation? Well, I would say that the 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 U.S. stock market is uh, basically best of breed, and mm -hmm. a lot of money. Can, you know, there's so much money out there, and it can't find a home, right? And so it has to find its way either to the bond market or to the stock market. Exactly. That's why you're seeing yields at record high. There's 15 trillion dollars worth of negative yields as we speak, right? In Germany, yeah, exactly. record negative yields every day. And so people are putting money in banks, and then paying the banks to hold their money, right? You have to pay exactly. to hold the money. Yeah. And, and so there's nowhere for the money to go. That's why uh, basically uh, it's like penguins in the South. Exactly, you know, exactly. They all, they all uh, stand as close to each other as possible. Exactly. And try to shop to the middle of the pile. Because, yeah. You know, like I think, and all of that does, it props up the prices higher and higher and higher. So mm -hmm. there's no real valuations. Uh, what we're seeing is really there's no flight to quality. Exactly. And and uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies represent non-correlated assets. They represent something where basically if you if you need the doomsday insurance, you better buy some Bitcoin. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, but but what we're missing is really and instead of a doomsday application, we're missing an everyday application. Mm -hmm. And and part of what Celsius is saying is look. Lending and borrowing is, uh, an, or interest income is an everyday application. Let's yeah. use a blockchain for that instead mm -hmm. of just uh, doing a doomsday uh, scenario kind of uh, protection. Exactly. And again, just one more question about valuations. Uh, would you say it's just tech that's overvalued right now in the stock market? Or you kind of see that in all sectors, including healthcare, industrials, everything across the board? Well, borrowing is so cheap that. Uh, the company's profits are very, very high, mm -hmm. artificially, and the multiples are high. So it's like a double jeopardy, right? I mm -hmm. mean, uh, people think that somehow earnings are going to continue growing. Yeah. You know, like uh, the comps for this quarter are 1% for versus last exactly. year. So, yeah. so they, they, we look, we squeezed all the GDP already. Yeah that we can get through basically growth and through kind of technology and innovation. And now it's all financial engineering. So mm -hmm. we're at the end of the cycle uh, where, you know, these financial companies and, and Wall Street companies are trying to squeeze the last few drops of, of uh, uh, you know, um, of growth mm -hmm. uh, through financial engineering. And exactly. that's when you know that the disaster is about to happen. Exactly. Uh, so just one more question about, so watching all that's going on with the Federal Reserve, do you guys watch interest rates closely on if they cut, if they raise, where do you see them going? And would you say interest rates have any direct effect on your company at all based on what the Fed does or the direction they take? So of course, look, so uh, 2007, 2008, the, the Fed, the cut the rates to zero to basically bail out the banks, right? So they, they enabled the banks to continue charging us, the consumer, 25% on our credit card, but the cost of capital was basically zero negative. And, and, uh, and that was fine to kind of bail out the banks, but that was uh, 10 or 11 years ago, right? So yeah. the banks are more profitable than ever, and the Fed should have raised rates, and just to enable savers to earn some money on their deposits. But they really, when they tried to do that, the stock market and the bond market yeah. threw a fit 
cried like a baby. <laughs> and, and the Fed the chicken out. Exactly. Stopped raising rates and obviously recently even lowered the rates. We saw so that. You know, they're like, they're basically, they're not independent. They're not what they're doing, what they're supposed to be doing. Exactly. They're supposed to be acting in the best interest of the entire Of the people, country, not yeah. Not just in the best interest a few crybabies who are not going to make their bonuses next week. Exactly, so, exactly. So I think, again, the, the problem we have is that there are seven and a half billion people on this planet who want to earn more of their money, yeah. and there's nowhere for them to go. Yeah. And if you look where Celsius pays 8% uh, on stable coins, so you exactly. can take your U USD, or you can take your Euros or Japanese Yen, Deposit it with us and earn 8%. If you want to be paid to sell token, uh, you'll make 10% per year. Exactly. So, like I said, that's 10 times more than the average in the United States, which is still less than 1%. And it's infinitely more than what Germany or Japan pays because mm -hmm. they have negative rates. So, so my point is, is that the bank has a return on capital of 18%. Yeah. Uh, they can pay you 7 or 8% on your money, but they don't have to, right? Because they there's no competition, to. and yeah. the Fed is not helping here. So, fuck that. Fuck that. Exactly. I agree with you 100%. Uh, you kind of spoke about how, like, one of the good things about Bitcoin is maybe a doomsday, something to have on, say, a doomsday. And a lot of people say maybe gold is like that or bonds is like that. For example, for the day that the stock market crashes, they say it's good to hold gold or it's good to have bonds. How do you compare crypto to, say, an instrument like gold or instrument like, like bonds specifically, excluding stocks? Sure, so gold is an excellent uh, uh, asset. Uh, it is not fully de um, detached or um, uncorrelated mm -hmm. to the dollar because uh, you can see that, for example, when the VIX jumps, uh, gold doesn't jump. Exactly, anything, right? yeah. So, uh, so it's still a correlated asset. And again, it's very hard to move and most of the gold you're buying in the UK or in the US or wherever, or Singapore, wherever it's sitting, uh, could still be confiscated or, uh, um, you know, the instrument you're buying not necessarily going to deliver the gold in case of a global disaster. So, so I think um, older people are comfortable with that as kind of like uh, their uh, doomsday flight to safety emergency fund source. But young people who grew up with tokens mm -hmm. and games and, and stuff like that are much more comfortable with blockchain and Bitcoin as an alternative kind of uh, decentralized solution. So, so I think it's a generational thing. Of and, course. And, um, you know, like all the wealth that is going to be moved from the old generation to the young generation, when the young people get their money from their parents, they're going to look in their portfolio and see 5% in gold. Exactly. And say, Fuck that. <laughs> No, 100%. Uh, just going back to Celsius for, for a quick second, can you speak about the underlying technology behind it and kind of the team you have that put this whole thing together to make it the success so, that it's been today? So our business plan was let's take what the banks do and do exactly the opposite, right? Yeah. Uh, so the banks, uh, again, take your money, right? You get, let you get, you get your salary and... Uh, and you try to deposit it in the bank and they immediately take your money and lend it to me on my credit card. Yeah. Charge me 25%, pay you nothing unless you move the money to savings account. And even then they barely pay you 1%, right? So I, they charge me 25, they keep 24 yeah. and you get one. Exactly. And they that's take that they 24%. <laughs> uh, that 24% uh, last year for JP Morgan was $30 billion yeah. in profit. That's five dollars per person on the planet right yeah and they take all that money and they give it to their shareholders right exactly so basically almost nothing goes to the depositors so Celsius said well what if we gave 80 percent of all that money to the depositors what if we instead of charging 25 percent charge nine percent for the loans and then gave seven or eight percent back to the depositors that's all we do so Yes, we're employing blockchain and technology and we have uh, complex yeah. algorithms and all kind of other stuff, but the business exactly. is actually very, very simple, they, right? Yeah. We yeah. loans, we collect interest, we give the interest to 
our depositors. And all the loans are asset back, meaning we only lend to people who give us crypto. Yeah. Uh, and we charge them a half or a third of what our competitors charge. Exactly. And if you were to put like, say I'm an investor right now, I have money on the side, I'm looking to invest. I'm choosing between something like Celsius or the stock market or the bond market or gold or other instruments, maybe real estate. Can you kind of tell us where Celsius stands on that list? Why people should put their money inside of it on an overall perspective, not just return, but also risk analysis and just looking at it at a top level. Why as an investor, my funds would be best off in Celsius. Also, so look, we, we, in no way am I saying that uh, somebody should take all their money and put it into crypto, mm -hmm. right? I yeah. don't think the industry is mature enough to where you really know what's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. So I think a 5 or 10% allocation is probably the right uh, allocation. Okay, five, and frankly, the, the, the more money you have, the lower your Bitcoin allocation should be. The, the less money you have, so if you only have a few thousand dollars, you should probably do 30% allocation to mm -hmm. Bitcoin, right? Yeah. But, but because your chance of returning or, or having financial independence or retirement uh, with the money is zero unless exactly. you do something that has a huge return. And Bitcoin is the best performing asset class in the last 11 years. Of course. It doesn't matter where you measure, from when yeah. to where, including all the dumps and including all of the bulls, and you will. Bitcoin will outperform any stock, any bond, of course, any gold, anything, right? So, yeah. so if you are an average Joe and you don't understand anything about this stuff, uh, I recommend to just buy something like GBTC, right? Mm -hmm. This is a public stock. I know it's tra trading at a premium. But yeah. For simple things, I would just put, like, I use a service called iBillionaire, which is an app. Mm -hmm. You download it. You tell it, hey, take money out of my bank account every week and buy Bitcoin. With it. Exactly. And it just goes and buys GBTC. And the rain or shine, uh, I'm on vacation or not, because I, I, I don't. It doesn't even look at the price. It just buys it. And, and what that does, it, 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 it kind of completely disconnects you from all the emotional ups and downs and saying, oh my God, I'm such an idiot. I bought it at the top. I didn't buy it at the bottom. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> you can't time the market 100%. Right. Yeah. It's, it's like the Peter Lynch approach to Bitcoin. Exactly, right? yeah. Definitely. So, so, so I think for the average person who doesn't know anything about exchanges and private keys and things like that, that is the safest thing. Now, if you're a little bit more sophisticated and you know how this stuff works and you go, you can go to GDAX or... or, or uh, <laughs> Or what some more spells to get really good rates and try hold your private keys. And yeah, you can do that, or you can just. Sorry? I didn't hear you. Oh no, I didn't ask anything. All right, so yeah, so, so if you're a little bit more sophisticated, uh, you can basically go to one of the exchanges, buy yeah. Bitcoin. And then deposit it with Celsius and earn interest. So, so instead of just Bitcoin appreciating, now you can earn all the appreciation plus get another six, seven percent from Celsius on on top of it because we are earning yield and we're returning most of it to the community, right? So, exactly. Um, so that is an amazing proposition. And that Celsius has three different asset classes. It has stable coin, which is obviously the lowest risk. And uh, you can just earn whatever eight percent, like I said, on stable coins. Yeah. But uh, again, your your stable coin is losing three percent a year to inflation. Right? Exactly. The dollars are most people don't understand that, but dollars depreciate of every year over time. Yeah. And so, right. But but uh, if you buy Bitcoin, you have a chance of appreciation. Yeah. Because it's a de because it's a, a deflationary uh, asset. And on top of it, you will earn interest uh, with Celsius. So, um, and if you really want to go risky, you can do old coins that we have and, and really kind of speculate on yeah. Ethereum or on Dash or on, on Orbs or any kind of project that you think will do very, very well because of this and that reasons, because you've done research and so on. So we don't recommend, we don't tell you, hey, buy this or buy that, or we actually, you cannot buy 
any coin who sells this. We don't sell it. We exactly. Just earn interest. You just earn interest. And just another question. So we ask all our all the people we interview this. Where do you see the price of BTC specifically specifically going over the next year? And something that many people like. For, like investors, legendary investors such as Warren Buffett, and you see them talking about it all the time. They say there's no real way to value crypto, value BTC. Like when you're looking at the when you're looking at a company in the stock market, there's a bunch of different valuation approaches that maybe work, maybe don't. But what do you say to the to the super investors like Warren Buffett and those people that say you can't really value crypto? And second question, following that, where do you see BTC going over the next year? Yeah, so, so I think, um, look, I don't think there's a way to value dollars because yeah. behind behind every dollar, there's 23 trillion worth of debt. Exactly. And, and another 100 trillion or more worth of liabilities in terms of retirement and social security and things like that. So, so yeah, you can say, well, the US dollar uh, is tied to all the earnings of the American companies, and that's worth this is, and that much, and the ability of the government to tax and so on. But frankly, all this debt that's piling up, uh, I'd much rather own Bitcoin, which was bought with real hard assets, has zero debt behind it, and uh, then own something that has this tremendous amount of liabilities and, and uh, uh, IOUs behind it, so so I I think it's actually pretty easy to value Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, be, because the cost of mining and the happening and so on is really determining what is the low watermark. It's it keeps moving up the watermark because it's getting more and more expensive to mine stuff. More and more coins getting lost or people lose their keys. So the total real supply is not 21 million. It's yeah. more like 17 million. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Right, and then and more and more users use it every day. It's a fully transparent platform, I meaning you can count how many wallets are on the platform, and that number keeps going up and up and up. So, if the usage increases and the supply decreases, and uh, well, you know what's going to happen prices are going to go up. So as long as those two things are happening, Bitcoin will outperform the dollar. And if you plot the dollar versus the Bitcoin, you will see that the dollar lost 99.9% .9 of its value already. Exactly, exactly. Do you have like a set range that you see it being at? Or do you, do you are you just assuming it'll go up based on that, based on those variables? I, I well, I was about to say that I rest my case. I think, yeah. <laughs> that, you know, the fact, the fact that it's going up and down has everything to do with who are the new people that are joining and nothing to do with the intrinsic value of a Bitcoin. A Bitcoin is, used to be a Bitcoin and it's still a Bitcoin. What moves up and down is the dollar value, right? Yeah. So we, we went through four cycles. You know, I, I, I call it the four men reeler race, where the first guys to kind of grab the baton from Satoshi were the anarchists and they were like going crazy. They got a million people and then uh, they couldn't finish the race. They handed off the baton to the, uh, 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 libertarians and during that handoff is when Bitcoin drops 80 percent the first time yeah right? it goes from whatever 20 to like two or whatever it was right and and the, and the, the libertarians try to finish the race right running with the baton and they get three more million people to join them but that's not enough right so they hand off the baton to the speculators and during that handoff Bitcoin drops again from a thousand or eleven hundred exactly. back to three hundred or whatever, right? Yeah. So we see that cycle again and again and again. When when the speculators thought that they're gonna run it to twenty thousand and they're gonna hand off the baton to the institutions, it just didn't happen in two thousand seventeen and eighteen. Mm -hmm. And Bitcoin dropped from twenty to three and a half thousand. Yeah. So, and so it's all about who is the adoption. And you know, I keep doing these lectures where I say, Hey guys. Stop relying on, on Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley of course. and Deutsche Bank to come and bail you out. The yeah. only people who are going to bail you out is the next 100 million people who are going to come and use crypto. Exactly. And unless you unless you give them a killer app, they're not going to show up. So you better work on the killer app instead of hoping that this or that institution, Fidelity or whatever, is going to come and bail you out. Yeah. So then this handoff that we're going through right now, we are just in the middle of that handoff where the speculators 
are who came from fiat land to crypto land they thought they're going to become rich and famous are all leaving back to fiat land and and we're replacing them with true believers with hodlers yeah the celsius community is all hodlers right exactly we have 350 million dollars from hodlers who basically say i'm never selling my bitcoin you better earn some interest for me exactly and, and the fourth runner on this race the fourth runner to finish the the race the four four man real race and get us to a hundred thousand dollars or more are these people who really want to use it for store value for interest income for uh, cheap loans and use all the utilities that that come with the public uh, uh, immutable blockchain exactly uh so thank you so much for breaking that down the differences between the stock market and the crypto space where you see it going let's just go back to celsius for a quick second so what do you have in plan for the company over the next year to maybe five years any huge milestones or things of that nature that you see coming and how do you see the environment changing for celsius so we, we're adding, right now I think we have 18 coins uh, and tokens, we're adding six more, mostly uh, uh, staking coins. Mm -hmm. So you'll be able to stake your EOS or Tezos or we already have Orbs and Dash and a few others, yeah. Algorand and so on. And, and so that's what kind of one asset class for people who are looking for yield, it's almost like the bond market. Exactly. Uh, then we have the traditional top, uh, coins like uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, so on, Bitcoin Cash. So that's for people who are like hardcore uh, uh, believers. And, mm -hmm. and then we have uh, stable coins. That's for people who just want to earn yield on their fiat and they still want some asset to be in fiat. Yeah. So we think those are like the three legs of the stool. Yeah. And we, we're going to have a billion under management wow. by the end of this year. We're adding two to three million every day. And But again, look, we, we're doing this for the community. We're exactly. basically saying, look guys, if we don't bring enough new users, we're not going to finish this race. We're not going to be able to get Bitcoin to new highs. So the, I'm sh it's a shout out to everybody who's listening to this podcast. Yes. All of your friends. You gotta convince other people that this is real. This is acting in your best interest. This is the only platform, the Bitcoin, the Ethereum, the only platforms that actually are there to act in your best interest. None of the banks, none of the insurance companies, none of the broker dealers are acting in your best interest. So unless we all get together and stop giving our money for free to the banks and put it somewhere else in an institutions that act in our best interest, Nothing's going to happen. The only reason the banks are powerful is because we give them our money. Exactly. Money. Exactly. So you're, you're, you're pretty much saying what the banks do with your money is give you some shitty return while profiting and giving back to shareholders. You see they're increasing dividends almost every quarter or at least every year by a significant amount. So what you're saying is what Celsius is doing is instead of hodling all those returns, it's actually giving back to the community, giving back what they we, deserve we, to be earning. Yeah, we get 80% back to the community. In our app, if you download our app and log in, yeah. you can see exactly how much we have on deposit, how many loans we issued, how many users are using the platform, how much we paid in interest. So you can audit us to 24-7, 365 and, and verify that we actually, and what we're earning or the, the dividend you talked about, mm -hmm. yes, we're giving 80% of the back to the community every week. That's we crazy. That's, that's amazing. Every week we pay more and more interest back to the community. Now, the job is to grow the community. If we bring the next 100 million people, then Bitcoin will go to 30, 40, 50,000. If we stall or if we don't bring enough new users and it's just a club of people who are talking about doomsday every day, mm -hmm. then nothing's going to happen. Of course. So it's, it's up to us. Are we going to deliver or are we going to fumble and not finish the race with this baton? Exactly, you know? exactly. And just to speak about some partnerships celsius have in play would you say you guys have partnered up with with a lot of other companies or are you guys more of a sole entity doing its own thing no look we, we are um, a very active member of the community yes. uh, i've spoken in over 200 events from meetups to the largest conferences like consensus and uh, i just spoke at gmic in in, in, in Guangzhou, china Mm -hmm. yeah, I was in Singapore doing a keynote, right? I'm, I'm in yes. Toronto next week. 
and uh, we partnered with the United Nations uh, to basically enable the United Nations and the SDG uh, uh, platform to accept cryptocurrencies as donations. And we partnered with the wallets and platforms to enable them to offer interest income. And we're announcing a variety of different partners. Uh, we just announced a partnership with Bitcoin.com. And so we work with all the good actors in our community, right? We, mm -hmm. we are helping them promote their services and, and become more uh, scalable and profitable. And, and at the same time, uh, help the community do better. I mean, if, if you don't, if you don't focus on the users and doing good for the users, then you're not going to survive, right? Of so course. Just, the reason for our success, look, we just published our numbers last week. We did 2.2 billion in loans in one year. That's, that is more unreal. than all of our competitors put together. Yes. Blockfire and Salt yeah. and Nexo and all these guys who've been around for several years charging customers 18 to 24%. And then we showed up and said, no, you should not charge more than 9%. 5 to 9%, that's all we charge on loans, right? So, so we, we cut the no fees, uh, a third of what these guys used to charge, and all they can do is part us online because they have no answer to charging people less. Exactly, exactly. So if you guys focus on the end user and you'd say that's the biggest reason for your success. Because like, Give the power way. back to the people. Yes, of course. That's exactly what we're talking about. Again, guys, so... Thank you so much for coming today, Alex. We really liked speaking to you. It was great to give our fans, someone who's had so much success in the ICO market, in the crypto space. And we're sure us and our fans specifically are very excited to what you'll do next. We see how many startups you've created, how much success you've had. Is there anything else you'd like to say to the people before closing up? Huddle, huddle, huddle. Huddle, huddle, huddle. Okay, thank you so much, Alex. <laughs> Take care, man. Right. Be in touch. Take Bye. Care.